Welcome to Thabad Lab Live. This is a series of uh, conversations hosted by Thabad Lab to help inform the public discourse. One of our ongoing interests is the region, uh, the South Asia region, and in particular, uh, China. Uh, we've had conversations about China in the past, and we are delighted today to welcome uh, Dr. Ivan Rasmussen from the New York University Shanghai campus in Shanghai, China. And today we're going to try and understand China a little bit better. Uh, welcome to the Bad Lab Live, uh, Ivan. Uh, it's great to have you here. It's and fantastic to be here. Thank you so much. It's amazing times to be alive for somebody who's not Chinese living in China. Yeah. yeah. Um, it must have taken you a while to learn about China, kind of a basics about China. Yeah. Uh, Everybody wants to talk about China, but not a lot of us really understand or know what, what China is all about. Yeah. I thought maybe we could start our conversation by, by learning a little bit more about China. Absolutely. The big story about China, of course, is that it's totally transformed uh, in terms of its economy. Yeah. What is that story like? How long did it take? What were the, what were the primary drivers of that change? Mm -hmm. How did it get from being a real backwater and, and an unpleasant place to being so exciting that among, the, among America's brilliant, most young uh, professors and intellectuals. It's too kind, uh, too kind. You, uh, but you're not alone. There's many really superb U.S. intellectuals who not only want to work on China, but who actually want to live and, and breathe in China, yeah. like you. How did that transformation take place? Absolutely. Well, sir, first, I would, I would want to clarify a little bit from my side, which is that um, I think also there are generations before these, the current set that are doing work in China that were very fascinated by, by China and the East, um, not just from, let's say, the United States or the West, um, but also within Asia. Um, and that gets to your point. They, this group didn't have full access until Gaiga Kaifeng, our reform and opening up under Deng Xiaoping in 1979, 1980. So beginning in the 80s, uh, uh, led usually in a kind of um, leader focused analysis of China. Deng Xiaoping um, opens up the country um, after the tumultuous Cultural Revolution, um, after uh, tensions with the quote unquote gang of four. Uh, and in that context, uh, Deng Xiaoping is seeking not just to start to hear more voices, and this is now the opportunity for scholars from out the outside to come see China, but also to um, allow China to not only economically develop, but also um, start to gain uh, its own expertise and its own uh, understanding, uh, not just of what it's, it's doing, but also of, of the world. Um, so, And also maybe equipping young Chinese to have the globally competitive skill sets, yeah. not just in techn technical things or technological things, yeah. but also in terms of how they think and yeah. how, they, how they relate to scholarship and knowledge? I would, I would say the first step was actually getting better understanding of technical skills and technology in general, right? Um, so if you think about this, this is the grand um, miracle of the uh, made in China model. Um, which is the first step is export-oriented or export-driven industrialization, particularly, and I'm kind of drawing a line of the coast here, um, in areas like um, uh, Shanghai, where, where, where I work and, uh, and have been living for the last three years, or Shenzhen, across from Hong Kong, and so forth. So um, the first stage, I actually think, was more geared towards those technical skills. And I would argue the movement today is getting towards much more of creativity, innovation, and getting that kind of um, forward thinking uh, uh, ideas about what's on the next cusp. Um, and in that context, I think one should understand Deng Xiaoping's um, ideas really centered around something called foreign direct investment. Uh, foreign direct investment would drive some of those coastal growth stories, but also it would mean that you would have foreign companies coming into China. And foreign uh, expertise. And foreign right. expertise, yeah. And I think, I think that's where the story starts to become quite interesting. There's also during this period of time major reforms in terms of the education sector, um, something that I'm um, quite interested in, not just in the Chinese context, but globally. Um, and those reforms uh, allow for uh, an, an amazing achievement. And, and, and this, despite whatever criticisms you might have of Deng Xiaoping, um, of, of the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, or even just in general of, of the way in which global affairs are conducted, our foreign affairs are conducted too, um, this is an amazing achievement, lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. So I want to explore this idea a little bit further. 
In terms of the principal drivers of the change, so obviously the, the principal driver is a decision that China wanted to change and wanted to grow. Yeah. But it sounds to me like, and, and perhaps it's a bias that I have, but it sounds to me like openness to foreigners, mm -hmm. which is in a little bit counterintuitive because yeah. I think especially the Western view of China yeah. is that it's like this closed box yeah, exactly. that doesn't want to be understood by anybody and doesn't want to understand anybody else. It's big enough mm -hmm. and independent enough on its own. That's why they close off the internet mm -hmm. and you know you can't do Facebook or Google in China yeah. because it's closed off. Yeah. But what I'm hearing from you is that the, the opening uh, salvo yeah. in the great China growth story was openness. Yeah. Is, that, is, that, is that accurate? Yeah, and I, and I don't think that it was something totally new. Um, I, again, I, I'm not, a let's say, a dynastic historian of, of China, but I don't think that openness is totally new. I think you could certainly see it perhaps during, let's say, the Song Dynasty, early Ming Dynasty, not late Ming Dynasty, as much whenever China actually does start to get closed off. Um, so yeah, I think openness was at the center of that. Um, Deng Xiaoping quite iconically said, um, however, um, that if you, whenever you open up the window, a mosquito might fly in, right? So there is uh, both an excitement and a, a, a dynamism, a kind of dynamic uh, 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 movement uh, to this openness, but there's also, I think, some degrees of anxieties about it. Um, and that's why, why the, the story gets even more complicated, right? Um, the success happens um, at the same time as there are challenges, right? How do we interact with these new, these new actors? How do we interact with these foreign companies? Um, uh, what does it mean to do a joint venture, right? Um, joint ownership, so forth, so on. Um, and so in that context, I do think that the openness was, was, I agree with you, the openness was central to the idea, but it didn't come in a kind of wa full wave of openness. It, it came in, in waves that would kind of come back and go forward, go back, go forward. Back. Which, would be dis which would be distinguishing uh, from the, maybe what happened after the fall of the Berlin Wall, mm -hmm. where there was a sudden, yeah. you yeah. know, openness. Yeah. And, and, and clearly the transition has been, is it fair to say the transition has been managed in China better than, than the way it was in, in Eastern Europe? I have to think about this in terms of, and I'm sorry, it's, 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 it's complicated, right? I'd have to think of these in terms of different kind of cones. One would be economic, one would be political, um, but I would say in the very least in terms of development from what I've seen, um, the average Chinese person's, the average Chinese person's daily life has improved just exponentially, right? And, I, and I'm not even saying just in the, the Deng 1980s into the 1990s. And this is, again, on average, because there are different regions and different parts of China that are, that are definitely going through very drastically different experiences. Um, I would say this is on average. I would say also, this is not just then. I can think myself about whenever I first began um, looking at China, which may be relatively newer for some, which was in the early 2000s. Um, this was, uh, I first kind of, um, one might say, cut my teeth, or I first got my great experiences in China in Beijing. Um, and whenever I was in uh, Beijing, I, I watched it develop. I watched the movement eventually to the Beijing Olympics in 2008, which is a pretty important moment in my view, and, um, and that whole year, in fact. Um, and then where I am now, about like 15 years since I, I began that inquiry into China, um, it's unbelievable. You go to Shanghai and you look at the Bund, which was this colonial concession, all of the old buildings there um, still intact, which is a really interesting dynamic. And then from the Bund, where you have these old colonial building, buildings from like the 19th or early 20th century, you look across and you see Pudong or Pudong Xian, the new Pudong area, and it just flies up into the sky, right? You see the Shanghai Tower, you see um, all of these uh, uh, amazing sites. Whenever I first came to China, nothing. And I talked to Chinese colleagues who grew up in Shanghai. It was a marshland where they would go and um, go chase frogs and you know jump on lily pads and things like that. I'm you know I'm giving a kind of uh, perhaps a rosy picture of it, but it was definitely definitely almost nothing 15 years ago, 20 years ago, certainly 30 years ago. Um, it's it, the the one area where I get anxious though, um, and I and I and I feel free to ex express this anxiety as an outsider because I've seen major changes, not just in China, but in my own country of the United States, is with the speed at which this happened, right? So at the same time as I remain sanguine and optimistic about the development of the average Chinese person's life, I also get anxious about the speed, the quickness of it all, um, because that's a very, very fast transition 
um, and, 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 and also it ha comes with it some of the issues that we see in the United States about uh, inequalities, particularly between rural and urban areas. So this great openness uh, has, has created all this economic opportunity and as you rightly say, uh, a lot of changes as well that may not be as well understood yeah. may also be negative. Mm. Um, I'm still keen to learn more about the, the transitionary process. I mean, it went from being a very poor country yeah. to being a relatively rich one. What was the role of the state in all this? I mean, we know, yes, communist and centralized, yeah. Yeah. but how did the state change yeah. as, as the economy was changing? We don't know enough about how much society has changed, yeah. or, or there's critics and there's questions, yeah. but what about the state and its changing role? Okay, great. So this is a really important question, um, and it's, I'm going to try and have it operate at a few different levels, some of which will be political, some of which will be economic, but I'm going to start with the third category, which is demographic. Um, and I'll bring it back to the state. I, I, pr I promise it just takes a second to get through each one of those cones. So in terms of demographics, are um, the population size of China, this has always been uh, varying, but also at a relatively high, high level, um, and predominantly in rural areas. Um, and so one of the first economic policies with reform and opening up was to loosen up um, these collective uh, agricultural units. So if you think about this during uh, both the Great Leap Forward, but also further so in the Cultural Revolution, um, you saw a collectivization of agricultural labor into groups, um, sometimes um, called work units are done way, right? So you have all of these collective units and they're being told to either produce a certain amount or they're producing a certain amount. And then once they're done, just like with the state-owned enterprise, then they're done for, done for that period of time, right? So decollectivizing those or breaking up those collective units with reform and opening up actually allowed people to have more economic say in their everyday lives. So you're, so you're actually, it's, it's, it's people kind of miss the irony of this, which is reform and opening up, the first sector to benefit was the agriculture sector in China. And the reason for this is people could choose what they wanted to produce, right? I'm going to bring it back to the state in a second, but this is important to say because the demographics that drew, drew, drove that was a large population, a large source of labor that are initially in rural areas, they initially do extremely well, but then you have a decreasing production of staple goods like wheat, rice, etc. This causes massive levels of inflation, right? So people are choosing, let's say, in this context, to, to make a tomato rather than to make a, a, you know, a, a piece of land produce uh, wheat, right? And they make more money for themselves at the onset, but eventually there's a lack of staple goods, a huge inflation by the late 80s, many not only economic but social and political issues are, are at hand. Um, that workforce eventually gets transitioned to coastal areas, to special economic zones, SEZs, where in these zones, free market capitalism gets a, gets a little try, right? So you can see already the economic and demographics are interacting. Free market capitalism with a little bit of a pat-pat from the state. Absolutely. So free they're, land. Yeah, uh, free know. land. They're, these, they, these are st they're still op operating as um, state-owned enterprises. They haven't been totally deregulated in, in terms of the, the control, right? Um, so there still are quotas. There, are, there still are, um, most importantly, in this context, there still is something called the HUCO, or the Household Registration System. Right, and so you, that means that if you, where you're born or where you study is where you're supposed to work. Um, this is a legacy for a kind of a Soviet legacy. It still is a big issue today. I would put that as one of my top five domestic issues for a Chinese uh, uh, political economy. Um, and there's a political dimension to it too, which is if you loosen up um, where people are supposed to work, then you're going to get even more of a flood of people from rural areas to urban areas. So there already was this flood because of of the opportunity in coastal areas. Um, Along with that opportunity came the challenges of, of the openness story, but also the challenges of moving out from where you were previously living, right? Changing the system and changing the approach. There's also a, an important story here that has to be talked about, which is, and, and, I, and the Chinese state has become much more open about discussing this with the most recent shift to a two-child policy, but there was the institution of, um, in the 1980s, uh, early 80s, of, of the one-child policy. So um, you can think about this, as, again, as uh, another very dynamic and, 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 and intense shift. So you, this demographic body of huge amount of labor is now being told, don't produce so much labor, right? So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bracket that and say, we'll come back to that, when, uh, hopefully, whenever we talk about the future of Chinese 
economic systems. Um, but the, 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 why this impacts the state is, is fundamental. First, this means that the state is doing the regulation of everyday people's lives, but less than they were in the past, right? Um, not, not so they've kind of broken down these. That also means that it starts to become a less of a link between the state or part and party and and the everyday people. Something described as the mass line, the interaction, the line to the masses. So, so the state in this case and the party has to go through a new set of reforms about how to interact with everyday human beings um, uh, in China. Um, so, so there's a transition from a directive relationship where the yeah. state is kind of controlling and telling people what to do to what? That's right. So I, this is, again, I, I would argue this is a matter of both a debate, but also one where it's still getting figured out today, right? Um, which is to say that um, in the past, almost every aspect of people's everyday lives was regulated. I'll, I'll give you an example of this in the context of the one child policy. Um, and that's so it's happened in the 80s and there still is an effort to do this, which is um, you would actually have women's a, a, a maternal health regularly monitored by area leaders, right? Which is, which is for us kind of unbelievable, right? Um, but that's, that was a form of regulation that has since then kind of dissipated, right? Um, and at the same time... So what's happened to the infrastructure for that regulation yeah. Yeah. and that monitoring? Well, so the infrastructure, I think, transitioned. The infrastructure transitioned from being purely state to, um, to being a local, local level set of actors. Um, and usually you see those existing um, at, in household areas. So um, in China, typically, um, uh, Xiaochu, our, our, our apartment complexes, are, have a uh, have a uh, either a fence or some sort of area around them, and then you have these tall apartment buildings within them. And these there are neighborhood committees within this that do some forms of regulation. But also this, I mean, this became a little bit more of the the of of, of uh, uh, kind of return to the wild west. Sorry to kind of borrow the U.S. Um, idea on this, which is is that in that process of deregulation. Um, Massive amounts of corruption came into existence. There's new money coming from the outside, right? Um, so there are, there are certainly kind of problems in, in the story of this. Um, what we should also say is that doesn't mean that the party itself didn't lose its traction and lose its power. Um, it, it, it did, it just shifted in different ways. So um, just to give a breakdown, the way that the state and party work is a kind of a mirrored structure. For example, Xi Jinping is the general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, but he's also, um, amongst uh, other positions, he's the president of China. Um, the way that he's elected goes through a process based on an interaction between not just the Chinese Communist Party, but uh, 150 plus other parties that exist in China. So, so President Xi is, uh, does he maintain separate offices? I don't know that. That's a good, that's a really good question. Um, but he is part of a group of about a, the standing committee of the Politburo, about seven to nine. Okay. And then, and those seven to nine cover functional areas, everything from uh, uh, commerce and economics to foreign affairs. And then after that, you have a group of 23. Um, the group of 23 then covers not just functional areas, but other things um, like uh, regional areas. So th there would be somebody who represents the major um, city provinces like uh, Beijing, Tianjin, Shanghai, Chongqing, right? Um, and then after that... And what about Dalian? Does that... Uh, Dalian? Um, I don't think that that's represented in that 23. Um, so so uh, you, have, you have this... Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's just Tianjin, Beijing, uh, Chongqing... Um, and uh, Shanghai, maybe, no, not Shenzhen. Um, so you, you see here, here you have these representatives from each kind of, so it's not just functional, but it's also regional. Um, and then after that 23, group of 23, you, you expand out to about 280 or so. And then finally you expand to the larger side, which is the People's Congress, um, which where uh, the CCP has uh, al almost like uh, 1,800 or 2,000 of uh, 2,500 per people um, Congress that actually does the legislative making. Um, so again, the CCP doesn't, does, is not the only party in terms of making laws, but it is the dominant in terms of numbers. Which is the most conservative of these groups? Is it the, is it the Congress itself, the, no. the People's Assembly or what? what? I, I don't know how, so here we have, to, we have to be careful about the words conservative. Let me, let me, let yeah. me explain yeah. what I mean. Yeah, sure. Uh, risk averse. Risk averse. Okay, not good. willing to invest in big change, clinging to the old way of doing things. Okay. Okay, got you. So the, the reason I say this is conservative in the context of Chinese and in terms of party and ideological politics, 
usually means conservative is in terms of uh, traditional Marxists are malice thought, right? Um, and so those would, those, the, those would be the quote unquote, uh, quote unquote actual leftists of, of the party, right? right. Um, rather than the rightists, which, would, which we would typically think of as being the conservatives, right? Um, so uh, in terms of the conservative actors, I would argue it actually does not depend on the bodies themselves. And they're kind of concentric circles, so they're expanding out. So it doesn't depend on the bodies. It depends on usually the top leader's um, background and to a varying degree what their functional office or their regional office is. So I, was, I would anticipate in this context that in terms of conservative, uh, in terms of risk adverse, you would see somebody in terms of regions in Beijing being more risk adverse as a representative of that at the, at the, at the Politburo than you would um, uh, necessarily somebody from Shanghai. Now that's what I would anticipate. That may not be true. I think actually it probably is more related to people's backgrounds, right? Um, and so in that context, and I'm not talking about current leaders at all. I'm just saying this is kind of the, the that. That's the profile. Yeah, it's the profile. Um, so uh, again, uh, and let me let me explain a little. Yeah, bit. I'm trying to I'm trying to get at where your question's going. Sorry. Yeah. So so I'll tell you exactly why I'm asking this question. Yeah. There's an impression about President Xi mm. as a big agent of change, yeah. uh, a leader who has come in with a very uh, I, I understand it to be yeah. a very decidedly reformist agenda. Mm -hmm. uh, because the system isn't American or Pakistani or, or Indian, yeah. uh, that agenda isn't just President Xi's. It's a, it's, it represents some sort of a consensus. Okay. But I also know that when you come in with big changes, mm -hmm. human nature is that change is resisted. Mm -hmm. yeah. What I'm trying to figure out is what, where does the resistance to President Xi's agenda lie and what is the basis for it? And I'm calling that the conservative end of modern, like, 2019 China. Yeah, now, yeah. my language might be off in terms of how you look at it, but what I'm trying to figure out is if President Xi is the is the change maker, yeah. who are the change stoppers? Okay. Where Where's that stoppage or obstacle coming from? Absolutely. So um, first, I would say, uh, in general, we the best way to describe Chinese internal politics is, is opaque whenever it comes to things like the interpersonal interactions on the Politburo and so forth. Um, however, many Chinese scholars, and a lot of them much more knowledgeable than myself, have looked at this based on different groups are um, uh, uh, within, within the party, right? So you have, um, usually they're described as a bunch of different coalitions. So there's a quote unquote elitist coalition, there's a quote unquote um, princeling coalition that has a link back to the party origins and, 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 and Mao's kind of chief military apparatus. And then you also have uh, people who came up through the local government systems yep. who have a different kind of relationship Absolutely. with the structure and then you have as a, opposed to like highly educated tech, sort yep. of almost technocrats. Yep. You have the technocrats, you have the work your way up level by level. Although that's, that's an opportunity for anybody who joins the party is sure. if you would like to, if you, if you would like to uh, uh, seek your political appointment by beginning at, let's say, being a village, uh, a party cadre representative, representing at the village level and then working up from county, province, so forth, so on, and then you can, you can, you can make that effort. And a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of top leaders have actually cut their teeth doing that. And, and these coalitions actually are not singular. It's not like you just have that identity. Um, Xi Jinping himself is a, is a great example of this. Um, he's generally is, can trace his lineage back to um, uh, uh, his, his father through through um, through through Mao, um, and uh, and as, as so his father's relationship with Mao. Sorry, and he and yet also he did the village level work and worked his way up kind of through the system. So you can have these multiple different levels. Um, part of this actually goes back to one of your original questions about Deng Xiaoping. So one of the things that happened is um, in that major economic and demographic shift, the party felt like it lost touch with people because it was doing less regulation, right? The mass line had been weakened. And in that context, Deng Xiaoping said, we need to improve this. And not only do we need to improve this, but we need to have party members that understand what's going on, right? So there was a big movement in the late, in the mid late eighties to recruit party members who were younger and so forth, right? Um, and those those be started to become described as um, the Shanghai group sometimes, but also are, were the junior people a new kind of idea, a kind of uh, a, if you would like to call it a youth movement for how not just the party but how the state in China works. 
So Premier Lee and President Xi are both from that generation. Is that correct? Um, they're both from the generation, but I don't know if they both went through the same. I no, I think they have they have different, different trajectories. They do. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, so so Li Keqiang um, might be described as being in a different group. Um, so uh, I think Cheng Li, who's uh, who's a great scholar in this, does 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 some good work, and he described he thinks that there's basically two groups: an elitist group and a populist group. Um, and the populist group, not in the sense of kind of popular nationalism, as you might think, but, but the idea that we need to focus on, um, rather than the elitist retaining power, but we need to focus on, on making people, make, people happy and something like that. And so he says that, the, so again, I'm channeling another person on this, and, 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 and of course, I don't want to uh, overstate what that, that, that statement is, but um, that there's this kind of back and forth in that dynamic, right? Um, and so many people would see perhaps that dynamic playing out in various forms between the two of them. Um, but um, in the very least, what we can take away from this is that the, the, is a fundamental shift. Yes, I think it was a tech, more towards more being more technocratic initially, but it hasn't given, back, given up on a uh, historical legacy of lineage, right? Um, there is still a lineage story that happens, it happens in terms of uh, Chinese party politics, right? There was a youth movement, um, and yet at the same time, it, that youth movement still had to harken back or did harken back to um, some elements of, of uh, who your um, ancestors are, who, who, who your, who most, most importantly, who your immediate family is or was. So here we are in 2019. Yeah. It's clear there's been this great transition from a poor country to a, to a really important, powerful country. And we'll talk about the powerful part a little bit later. But as I understand it, China now wants to transition from being the factory of the world yeah. because being the factory to the world also makes China vulnerable yeah. because if people don't buy what it's selling or if people's ability to buy is, is changed somehow, yeah. then the quality of life for Chinese people will, will suffer. Yeah. So it, my understanding is that China for the last five to ten years has been thinking about and working on a transition to become more of a mall for its own people yeah. to, so that yeah. Chinese people themselves become the drivers of their economy. Yeah. More of a focus on local consumption, local product, production, yeah. and also an equalization so that people in Shanghai who live like, mm. like uh, mm. crazy rich Asians mm. and people in other parts of the country that maybe don't have the same economic opportunities, yeah. maybe a rebalancing of that. Now, in that transition, what is the what is the great plan, and and what is President Xi doing? Like kind of the top three things yeah. to to make that transition, and then what does that put China on the path to? What does the future look like? Yeah, yeah. So um, first, uh, not too much in the business of predicting the future, um, but uh, I think that what I can make an argument is that the first step of moving towards domestic driven consumption is well underway. It's well underway. Um, but that domestic driven consumption only helps in the economic sense that there's a significant s supply of goods and that, there, that you cannot have an over amount of risk by relying on pretty much one general market, which is or was the West, right? Um, this is the, again, we go back to the export-oriented industrialization of, um, of Deng Xiaoping. This is the great benefit to this actually requires that the U.S. and the quote-unquote West are buying those goods. Initially cheap goods, but not anymore. Now, now they're the iPhones of the world, right? Um, and so that model is shifting because of the need to get new markets and the domestic market but also because of the uh, oversupply of goods, which happened in that context, but finally because of that demographic new shift that I haven't talked about yet. Um, so the demographic uh, uh, shift that I, I spoke about was this huge labor population, now initially in rural areas, and then, just, then trans coastal, coastal areas, yeah. now they're really going back. You can look at migration statistics, it's really interesting. So the, people are tired of the cities. There is an element of people are tired of the cities. It's not like rural areas in China are, are, are small, right? They're still rather populous. So there's a story about people getting tired of the cities. It's also a story about wages increasing in those areas. and people not being, uh, companies not being able to pay at the same level, right? So there's that story. Um, and in that demographic shift, China, whether you, uh, whenever you go there, you never think that this could be the case, is aging and aging rather rapidly. 
Um, not just in the context of the one-child policy, and I think this is a fallacy. I think people make a mistake whenever they think about this, but um, the population is aging and getting smaller in the context of modernization and the one-child policy, which is, turns out, it's quite expensive to have children in this modern era, and therefore, not only is there a government restriction, but also you see families making the decision um, not to have as many children as they did in the past. Generationally, that means you actually went really starkly from a generation of eight to 10 kind of children, particularly in rural areas, to one, sometimes two, depending on, there, there are certain variations on the one-child policy, um, uh, for particularly in rural areas. So that's, that's a pretty sharp transition, right? That means for a lot of things that this is gonna be a challenge for China. So it's not just that there's an anxiety about over-relying on a market, there's also been a domestic shift in the demographics in China that is fundamentally changing the way things are. And that has led to this focus on domestic consumption, but it's also focused on, or, or led to a focus on the need for creativity and innovation, China 2025. The idea that not just is this a, uh, is this a place, uh, is China a place where goods are produced and consumed, but also it's a place where they're developed and they're envisioned and they're, and they're engineered, right? Um, and in, 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 that, in that dynamic, uh, I, I, I see the big challenge going forward, not just being things like uh, the demographic pinch on social services, but also things like how do we educate young people? How do we get them involved in the economics of daily life in sectors which had previously been pretty well based in the West, particularly in the Silicon Valley. So, so there's a twofold thing going on. There's a, so the shift to creativity and innovation is really about one, there's just not as many people, so you can't stuff the factories, and the margins from those factories aren't as great as they used to be. Yeah. That's right. one problem. Yeah. And the other is that you want greater value for each mm. Chinese the productivity function mm. is much more valuable if it's driven by creativity rather than by copying stuff. Absolutely. Is, is that about? Absolutely. I, now, now, that being said, I've heard different visions on the not just copying stuff model. So this is usually a criticism of China that comes out that I think is really a challenging and complicated one about the protection of intellectual property rights. So China joins the WTO in 2001 um, at status as, as one of these least developing countries or, or, or developing countries. Um, and so the question today is whether or not that's still true. But in the, in the very least, that le led to some uh, at least leniency initially in terms of some rules of the international system. One of those rules that tends to be you know, brought up in conversations is China doesn't protect intellectual property rights. And I've become very anxious whenever we say box China as a single entity, because having seen it on the ground, it's not just China, it's local, local actors, right? You know, um, who will, who will um, kind of haphazardly or sporadically or even randomly crack down on intellectual property rights violations at a micro level whenever it serves their function, right? Um, and that's shifted, that's changed a little bit. Um, so, you, you know, going around and, and smashing the fake DVD store is a little bit different from what it used to be. It's now way more um, digital. Um, but, uh, but to this day, I, th I think it's difficult to bracket China as a, just in general, that this is a huge intellectual property right lack of protection. But I've heard arguments that said, well, in terms of creativity and, and, and innovation, and again, this is not my own view, in terms of creativity and innovation, not protecting intellectual property rights means that there's a look, it means that actually you can um, create a more dynamic, innovative sector in the sense that it's gonna be so fast. You come up with something, and uh, I'll give you an example that is, resonates in China, which is bike shares. So that you come up with a, a bike share, and, uh, and these are hugely popular. As soon as, as, soon as, you, as, soon as you visit China, the, one of the first things you see on the streets are just lines of bike shares where you scan a QR code and you get on the bike and you go and it costs pennies and you close it off and the next person goes and, and it gets you from, from metro station to metro station, from work to home, so forth. You come up with this innovation and I come up one with one that uses the, the rotations to charge my cell phone, right? And then you say, oh, well that was now forcing me, I've completely copied your model but I've just added a, you know, a charger on it. That now forces me to have the charger plus um, something else, right? 
Solar, solar panel. Solar panel yeah. are a bigger basket to hold yeah. things, yeah. are um, a, a, an electric car rather than... Or like a pink colored bike. Or, or a color that appeals, right? The, and, and so what, what, you, what you end up with here is, is an argument kind of against intellectual property rights that I've heard at times. That being said, I'm one who advocates very much that in order to get the startup money to create that, you got to protect intellectual property. You got to protect intellectual property. Um, so, so just to get back to your question about creativity and innovation, part of that story is how do we, yes, get more productivity out of people, but how do we start to lead not just in in, in China? And I, and I don't want to go down the line of because there's increasing focus on domestic consumption. That doesn't mean China's going to stop selling things. No, I get right. it. Yeah, um, it, In fact, I would argue it mostly means China will decrease some of the selling to the to the United States, and uh, and 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 in that case, the, this very trade war that we're talking about may become something that is more of, of the imagination than anything else. Um, but instead, I think it means that China will start to think about areas where its own creativity and innovation might be best received. Emerging markets in Southeast Asia, Central Asia. Places where maybe having the latest iPhones not at the top of the list, um, like it is, let's say, in the United States, and you know, I'm just using iPhone as an example here, um, but instead having something that is maybe a Huawei P10, yeah, or something like that, right? Sure. Um, and so, so those markets are where the creativity and innovation um, can coexist with driving domestic consumption and driving a shift in how young people uh, interact with the economics, not only within their own country as creative innovators, but also in surrounding areas. And I would argue the near periphery, and I would focus on Central Asia, I would say Southeast Asia, and because we're here also, I would say South, South Asia too is really big. And I don't, and I don't, I remain somewhat um, optimistic about the idea that uh, empowering people with creative thinking is a good thing. Uh, as a, as a just an, you agree with this? I, uh, uh, the, the, you you think that empowering people with the power, uh, with the ability to be innovative and to be yeah. creative is a good thing? I I I I agree with this one hundred percent, and I would I would even say this is not about China. I'm talking outside of just China. I'm talking about globally, and that as you empower that creativity and innovation, you're going to start to see interactions start, starting to form between different societies, and you're going to start to see we're going to we're going to have dis disagreements. We're going to have different. So this is uh, the reason I asked that question yeah. is that, you know, I mean, obviously it's almost like a, at least amongst people that I would end up talking to for in, in an in-depth conversation, I would expect that people would say, of course, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. uh, promoting, propagating, uh, nurturing creativity and innovation amongst young people, uh, young people yeah. is a great thing, is an yeah. important value. But in doing so, you are going to disrupt uh, the old order. Yeah, yeah. And a disrupted old order is going to react. Yeah. And I think that's happening all over the world. I mean, uh, the, the Brexit fiasco mm -hmm. is such a great demonstration mm -hmm. of the enormous disruptive potential mm -hmm. of people's feeling, mm -hmm. feeling, mm -hmm. not reality, mm -hmm. people's feeling mm -hmm. that their old order is being disrupted, yeah. even if they're young. Oh, yeah. So there can be young people who will feel like their parents' way of life yeah. which really is code for something else, is being is being attacked yeah, yeah. by all this new stuff. And often the new stuff is just a girl in a hijab yeah. or, you know, mm -hmm. a guy with slanted eyes yeah, or yeah, somebody yeah. whose skin color is yeah. not the right skin color. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it goes in all directions. I mean, in, in a country like Pakistan or in a country like India, it has to do with religiosity. Uh, yeah. And, and yeah. So in every country it's different. But but this resistance to change, yeah. uh, we know what it looks like in New Zealand, unfortunately. Yeah. We know what it looks like through Brexit. We are seeing it every day with yeah. President Trump. Yeah. What does it look like in China? What is it? So this is hard to see because I'm not sure that China has gotten to the creativity innovation level and the, the amount of change that is happening is there, right? Um, and I think that the sense of a fundamental restructuring of the old order um, is happening more of a resistance, not necessarily resistance to change. I, I would be, would not want to use the word resistance, but rather an anxi deep anxiety about it happens at the traditional level of human relationships, of, uh, of values regarding marriage, divorce, 
and also in rural versus urban perspectives on life. Let me tell you why I framed it that way, because okay, sure. it's a very deliberate framing. Okay, right? gotcha, yeah. Uh, maybe you, know, you, yeah. You, you know that as a Pakistani, I would have a rosy, uh, rose-tinted uh, lens on China. Yeah. I have a hypothesis about why we don't see this stuff in China. And it isn't just the overarching power of the state mm -hmm. controlling people. I think it's the fact that the Communist Party mm -hmm. and the structure does, in fact, plan for change mm -hmm. and is able to, through the size of its orderliness, mm -hmm. able to absorb a lot of the negative externalities mm -hmm. of change. Now, that doesn't mean it's perfect. Yeah. Nothing can be. And I think even, mm -hmm. even President Xi would admit, and, and openly, I think he has, mm -hmm. that there are uh, there's a dark underbelly to many of the great stories in China, yeah. both the yeah. big picture stories and, and the little you know, the people-to-people yeah. -people stories. Yeah. But in the main, the vastness of, of the state structure it, in many ways can absorb and process mm -hmm. the downside of change maybe better than the U.S. or Pakistan or India or other messy democracies could. Is that too rosy a, a lens on China? I think that it is a little too rosy of a lens because I can't there are many areas and pockets of China that I don't know well enough. This is a good moment to say um, anybody who, who, who comes to you and says, you're a China hand, um, you should face with a, you know, a little bit of skepticism. I'm, I'm, I would not put myself as a China hand in this regard because there's so many different pockets where, I, where, this, where that kind of unhappiness or resistance to change might be happening, right? And I might not just know about it, right? Um, I would also argue that um, one of the advantages of the way that these kind of creative innovation type stories have occurred is it also happens in a state narrative about Chinese identity. And so that's, that might be coming through the state, but it was a narrative that is quite useful. And it's this idea of the Zhongguomeng, the Chinese dream, right? Um, and that allows for change to be occurring but for there to be a shared perspective on a collective dream. A Very, change that's anchored in, in tradition. Yeah, exactly, right? You know, and this is why this is sometimes, sometimes it's described as a civilizational state. I don't necessarily agree with that nomenclature um, for China, right? Yeah, but, that's a uh, big problem. Yeah, so yeah, yeah that's exactly. Yeah. Dude, similar, I know. Um, but the idea that, that, that there is a collective dream. Now, as with any of these narratives, just like we know that the Amer quote unquote American dream itself is underneath it there are all kinds of problems and it's and it actually is a fundamental untruth right um the idea that you can you can come to the united states and just be successful by well it's you know my, my favorite framing of the of the whole american sort of construct is chris rocks right yeah we didn't land on plymouth rock yeah. plymouth rock landed yeah. on us yeah so yeah so, so, so you think there's something similar in china i think that there's a narrative in china that uh, that's big enough that's big enough that says that um, despite a lot of different communities, and again, I do think there probably are pockets of, of where this change is not going over well or at all um, that I don't know about and that I haven't studied, right? Um, but that there is a narrative about the idea of being China and the Chinese dream that has been a bit, really big, it's something you see on, on a daily basis, right? Um, it's a narrative that is, yes, something that's linked to Xi and the state because it's part of his governance of China. It's part of his, one of, it's one of his major foreign policy initiatives like Belt Road Initiative um, or One Belt, One Road, Idai Lu. It's also the, along with new model or new type of great power relations. China dreams at the center of this, right? Um, so much so that if you read his governance of China in the, um, uh, in the first volume of it, um, he talks about the shifting role of the People's Liberation Army. And it used to be narratives on the PLA, the kind of armed forces of China, was about contested territories, about um, uh, 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 you know maintaining internal and external security. Um, even to, the, to to this day, it talks a lot about uh, overseas Chinese. Uh, she says, "Okay, this is what the PLA should be doing. It should be promoting and taking care of and guarding the guarding being the key word here, the Chinese dream." That's in the first governance of China. So this is a fascinating shift, which is that um, this is not about different identities that are there, but there is a singular Chinese identity. Now, for those who are trying to deal with multiple different identities, I think that this might be a challenge. So again, there, there might be other things going on. So I wouldn't make it just that the state was you know, able to somehow somehow solve the problem, problem right, or the issue behind 
um, uh, encountering the new. Well, or not the so much solve, but my 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 proposition was not so much sorry, as sorry. a solution, yeah. but really as a as because it's so big and overbearing, if you will, mm -hmm. to, to use a maybe more negative term, mm -hmm. it's able to absorb that that. Mm -hmm extra energy mm -hmm. in probably a better way than, for example, the Pakistani state. You know, it's 220 million people, yeah. and we get we get so much negative criticism, especially from the West, on, for example, the size of our military yeah. Yeah. or the size of our public sector yeah. and public sector, uh, you know, subsidies. Whereas people don't really, like, like nobody ever asks, well, what are you supposed to do? Some things are rather simple, but a large state like we've just taken for granted that small lean government is the way to go Even yeah. though it hasn't worked anywhere. Yeah, right yeah. and so so not to suggest we should become China yeah. but just in terms of the size and and presence of the state yeah. Is it possible that China will be able to manage uh, stark identity-based changes in how people relate to each other and to their states better than better than some of the European countries that we've been seeing? I, you know, I'm not, I, again, I'm not sure if I would be willing to go out on the line of better, okay. because I do think that there is room in these democracies to sit down and talk rather openly about change, right? Uh, and again, I'm probably overly optimistic that discourse. About the potential of democracy. Yes. I well, think we should, I, but I, I think we should cling to that because I, I think you and I, I have think, that in, in I common. Think, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt. I, I, I would say not just the potential of democracy, but the potential of discourse. Sure. That, uh, a a d discursive or, uh, a, 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 a democracy is one that I think has um, one where, where, where you have that opportunity to talk about what's going on in this world.